In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Father Albert is in Georgia today uh, with a group of Kenyan um, immigrants, and uh, they are, uh, they called him and asked him to come down and celebrate Mass with them in their own native tongue, and uh, so he's doing that today, and uh, I want to, so I want to remember them in our prayer. Also, Deacon Mike Carl from our neighboring parish, St. Anne's, has, um, he was in an accident one day this week, and a tree fell on him, and that's a pretty bad business. Um, he's already had back surgery and um, has some work on the shoulder yet to be done. Uh, we're grateful that he's still alive, honestly, uh, but I'd like to lift him up in prayer as well. Um, and there's just a bunch of people um, who were here with us last week who came down with COVID. And uh, so we want to pray for them and for everybody who is affected by that sickness right now. Pope John Paul, St. John Paul, when he was Pope, um, named this Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, uh, the Divine Mercy Sunday. The scriptures and the prayers all point to the mercy of God who has saved us all from sin and death merely, ooh, merely by his love, by his mercy. Let us pray. God of everlasting mercy, who in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast kindle the faith of the people you have made your own. Increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font we have been washed, by whose spirit we have been reborn, by whose blood we have been redeemed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Our responsorial psalm is number 810 in the Breaking Bread book, number 810. <laughs>
A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although for now, for a little while, you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may, pr may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. <laughs> According to John. Glory to you, Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. The disciples, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith, a birth to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The story of uh, Jesus and uh, Thomas, like many other stories in John's Gospel, has a sort of hidden element to it. Jesus speaks of spiritual things and people hear about earthly things. The Samaritan woman, you remember, was talking about the water she came to the well to carry back home. But Jesus speaks of a new spirit within, a new source of life. The man born blind seems to have received his sight after he washes in the pool at Siloam, but he really sees when he recognizes Jesus as the one who enables him to believe. Now, in our time, this very word believe becomes a question. And you and I are the ones who must come to its deeper meaning. The disciples believe that locking the doors of the place where they are will in some way save them from the forces they fear. What they have heard from Mary Magdalene, what Peter and the beloved disciple have looked into themselves, the empty tomb only makes them confused. They still don't know Jesus risen from death. But when he overcomes their locked doors, 
he also begins to overcome their earthbound thinking. When he appears before them, in spite of the locked doors, they must know that he is now beyond the limits of material things. All seem to believe, except the one who was absent, our friend Thomas. In that first meeting, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. I came into the world with a mission from my Father, and now I place my mission in your care. And I give you my Holy Spirit that you may minister mercy, forgiveness, as I was sent to do. A week later, Jesus presents himself before them again and confronts Thomas, who has said he would not believe without touching the wounds of Jesus. We call Thomas the doubter, but what about the others? Are they really ahead of him on the believing curve? It was the others who announced to Thomas that the Lord had been raised, but they're still behind locked doors. Out of fear, afraid for their lives, for their physical safety. By Jesus' respectful treatment of Thomas, he is brought to the faith that allows him to say simply, my Lord and my God. What happens after this is chronicled in the Acts of the Apostles, that passage that we heard this morning, in which the giving of the Spirit is described as an event of an event 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. From that day on, the disciples, with Peter as their leader, begin to speak fearlessly, confidently, without a thought for their own inconvenience or even their physical safety. The community of believers grows and grows, not only in numbers, but in fearless commitment. They devote themselves to learning from the apostles, to the Eucharist, and to the prayers that were theirs as faithful Jews. And they formed a new kind of community with a communal life in which everyone's needs are attended to. Perhaps it was this church at its best that made others want to join them. In his very first letter addressed to the whole church uh, that goes by the title, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis encourages us, challenges us <coughs> to unlock our doors, the doors of our hearts, to welcome among us everyone who seeks hope, peace, a new life. He asks us to consider what we allow to insulate us from the community around us, what we might be afraid of that keeps our community inside. He even asks us to unlock the doors of this building so that it may always be a haven for those who seek Jesus. First thing I think of is security. Mm, just like those apostles. The believing that Thomas expresses with the words, my Lord and my God, indicates a new way for him to be related to Jesus. He's no longer master, rabbi. He is my Lord and my God. These, uh, this Thomas, Indian history says, went to India and enabled, his faith enabled him to bring the gospel to the shores of India nearly 2,000 years ago. 
This is also the believing that Jesus commends when he says to Thomas, blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. It is to a new and transforming relationship with Jesus that we are called in our own time. Jesus risen from death is our Lord and our God, who by trusting his human life to the Father's care, found himself free from the tomb, free from death, free to invite others to be one with him in faith and forgiveness and mercy. What will we allow to keep us behind locked doors? What will keep us from welcoming others into the communion of care and forgiveness and mercy that is the church at its best? 